Good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's presentation. Today we're talking about pollinators, the buzz on pollinators. With me, I'm James Stevenson and I work here at the University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences in Pinellas County, coming to you from Brooker Creek Preserve today. The pollinators, everyone's talking about the pollinators. Who can resist the charm of a bee butt covered in pollen disappearing into a beautiful flower? We're going to go a little bit deeper than that today and talk about just what pollination is to start with. Let's put the cart where it belongs and the mechanisms of pollination, the various techniques that plants have developed because after all, pollination is a plant system. And then we'll have a look at some of the agents that plants have adjusted for their own needs that have become today's pollinators. So let's <coughs> jump in. Guess what I've got stuck in my throat? <coughs> no coincidence, the pollination syndrome for conifers, ancient, ancient group of plants, they use the wind. And that is per, uh, particularly obvious this time of year as our conifers are releasing their pollen into the great pollinator, the wind. Raining down on cars, raining down on houses, everywhere, just pollen, pollen, pollen in the air. So pollination for a conifer is the transfer by the wind of pollen from male cones to female cones and special little sticky droplets that can catch that pollen out of the air and draw it inside to the female cones where the pollen grain germinates and grows and fertilizes the ovule to become a seed, a seed of a conifer. Conifers have been on land for quite a long time and had to figure out pollination with the tools that were available. And insects weren't really around yet when the conifers were getting started. They certainly weren't diverse enough to have brought into service as pollinators. And so today, all the conifers are wind pollinated. But for the flowering plants that came along much later, we get the more typical pollination syndrome. And for flowering plants, pollination means the transfer of that pollen substance from the anther, which are these objects around here, the anthers, the transfer of pollen from their site of origin, the anthers, onto the stigma, that little spot right on the top of that stalk there, onto the stigma of another plant. And just like in the conifers, because it's analogous, the pollen germinates and grows to find the egg cells. Fertilization takes place and seeds development. So the bottom line for pollination, pollination is how seeds are made. That's the point of pollination. Again, it's a plant-based concept. Pollination is for the plants. Pollination is plant reproduction. And these seeds represented here on this slide would not be possible, would not be, would never develop without an insect pollinator. And what did the insect pollinator do? The insect pollinator transferred the pollen from the anther of one plant to the stigma of another plant. The pollen grain grew down through the ovary and found the ovules and turned those ovules into seeds. The seeds, of course, in this instance being legume seeds, beans. And so we get that pollination is very important for the production of seeds. 
for human nutrition. We eat a lot of seeds. Um, we eat loads of legumes um, and so on. And we need the following to happen for another nutritional need. Let's take a cross section of a typical flower and we have the anthers, right? That produce the pollen and the stigma and the ovary and inside the ovary are the ovules that become the seeds. So what happens when the pollen grains land on that stigma, it's mentioned before, they germinate and they grow and the pollen grain grows all the way down through, burrowing through until it finds the ovules within the ovary of the plant, this very center of the flower. That ripens the seeds. So pollination is how seeds are made in the flowering plants. That's also where fruit comes from. Upon the fertilization of these eggs, chemicals are sent that inform the ovary, the tissue that surrounds all this magic, to begin to ripen. And in this example, we have a cherry blossom. So the cherry blossom, when it first opens, has its pollen ready to be transported to the stigma of another tree. Usually, uh, the pollen isn't ripe on the same plant when the stigma is receptive to prevent self-pollination. Uh, but for the cherry blossom, once the pollen is landed, grows down into the ovary, fertilizes the seeds, and all the extra parts begin to fall away. The petals are not no longer needed. The anthers, stamens, they can all just leave. Their job is done. And the ovary takes over and begins to grow and ripen and we end up with fruit. And of course, fruit is a ripened ovary with seeds inside and we eat a lot of fruit. And fruit would not develop often in the absence of this pollination. In the absence of the pollination, the plant's not gonna put all that sugar and energy into making sure that seed gets transported if there's no viable seed inside. So pollination is important not only for the production of seeds, for the reproduction of the plant, but for humans, for the production of seeds that we eat. Pollination is also important because it triggers the ripening of fruit. Whether or not we eat the seeds of that fruit, we eat the fruit. For the plant, and remember, pollination is just for the plant. Pollination facilitates the production of a viable seed and the production of whatever it's gonna to take to get that seed far away from home. So in the case of the cherry, the ovary ripens into a nice sugary fruit that an animal is gonna take and eat and disperse the seed far away from the parent plant. So pollination is the transfer of pollen from one plant to another by various mechanisms. And in the conifers and in some flowering plants, that mechanism is the wind. Oaks are a flowering plant that now depend on the wind to facilitate their pollination. And you know that those little things that fall off the oak trees, they're beginning now. Those are the male flowers. Those are the anther flowers, the anther bearing flowers. And they've released tons of pollen into the air. They're not very showy flowers, right? They're just little brown jobs on little ropes, but they release all that pollen into the air like conifers, but these are flowering plants and they drift and land onto a female oak flower, also very nondescript. They're not trying to attract anything. And that facilitates the pollination for the oaks. So the wind can be a pollinator. Grasses are pollinated. They're another flowering plant that's pollinated by the wind. And we don't think of grasses as flowering plants because they don't produce showy flowers because they're not trying to attract insects. 
they're they're not even trying to attract the wind because of course they can't. Um, but wind pollinated plants, being the conifers and certain uh, certain flowering plants, they just put little flowers out there and produce a lot of things. Pollen transfer is classically facilitated by insects. And insects have been around for a lot longer than the flowering plants. So insects were very well established when the flowering plants finally came around. And the flowering plants made a union, made a pact almost with the insects and pollination syndromes became much, much more specialized in the presence of insects. And you'll notice here that this plant is being visited by a group of insects that might not always be associated with pollination, with beetles. And it turns out that beetles were among the first of the pollinators. And some of the very first flowering plants used the labor of beetles and provided rewards to the beetles that were present at the time to help facilitate the pollination. There are some very, 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 uh, they're not primitive, they're just um, lineage, ancient lineage flowering plants that are still around today that are found in the fossil record. The water lilies are among, represent plants that were among the very first of the flowering plants. The magnolias are another ancient group that represent ancient lineages of flowering plants. And they are still kind of beetle designed. Uh, lots of extra petals, lots of thick parts that can be chewed and scrambled on and clawed and all these other things. Clumsy beetles can can mess around in the water lily flowers and the, the magnolia flowers. They're, they're kind of designed for, for uh, coping with um, having beetles involved in the mix. Other mechanisms of pollen transfer can include birds. And of course, birds are arriving on the scene much, much later. So flower, flowers have been around for a long, long, long time before there were reptiles and eventually dinosaurs, um, the living dinosaurs today being birds, birds being flying organisms, plants taking advantage of that and putting the birds into the service of the transfer of pollen. And you can see this little species of hummingbird has been pressed into service as a pollinator uh, the shape of the flowers that this bird evolved alongside provided that the pollen landed right on their forehead so that they would be transferred to another flower of the same species. And finally, mammals can even be the agents of pollination. Again, plants want to get their pollen from one place to another place. The best way to do that is through the air. There aren't that many mammals that fly, bats of course being the only ones, but plants being just as creative as they can possibly be, pressed the mammals as well into uh, pollination syndromes. And here we have a bat, again, unwittingly picking up and transferring the pollen from one plant to another. But the classic pollinators, of course, and the ones that are always often, most often associated with the whole pollination syndrome would be the insects. And among the insects, of course, the bees. We love the bees. And here is a collection of some of our native bees, the emerald bees, leaf cutter bees, bumblebees, uh, one of the chytrid bees, but this isn't a bee. Can anyone tell what that is? Can anyone tell? Love bugs. That's another group that's very, very good at pollination are the flies. And love bugs are a type of fly. 
But what's in it for the insect? You have to know. You must know what's in it for the insect. Why go from flower to flower? No reason for an insect to have any concern whatsoever about the production of a viable seed. That's nothing to do with the insect. The insect could care less if this plant reproduces successfully or not. Insects are only focused on today and what's in it for the insect today. Of course, the answer is nectar. And the reward that plants create, produce, synthesize is nectar. Very, very nutrient dense sugar solution that gives the insects energy and it provides uh, nutrition perhaps for the insects offspring. And also insects will, certain groups of insects will steal and eat the pollen of plants. So insects do an awful lot of taking from the plants. They take the nectar, they can take and destroy by eating the pollen, pollen is a protein. Pollen is very, very nutritious as well. But plants have a workaround because that's what plants do, continue to adapt. Let's have a look at some of the insects that we consider pollinators and that if we are thinking of attracting pollinators to our garden, what are we expecting to have? Um, of course, the butterflies are pollinators. Um, not really. Butterflies are certainly nectivorous, and they certainly have a very well adapted mouth parts. They have well adapted mouth parts that can reach. This is the mouth sticking out. This is the straw, the proboscis that can reach way down deep into flowers, even if that pollen is, is tucked away, hidden away, all the way down in the base of a flower, the butterflies can reach that nectar and they can drink it up through this long straw. But what you'll note about the butterflies is that they tend to tiptoe around the tops, around the tips of the flowers. They're not in there getting dirty. They're not in there rolling around in the pollen. They're barely making any contact with the pollen bearing structures whatsoever. They're basically nectar thieves, the butterflies, not all of them. And I'm not saying that there aren't a few here and there that could be a pollen grain, one pollen grain right there on the proboscis, but not really good agents of pollination, the butterflies. There's a moth that has even uh, become very, very much like a butterfly and it will hover in front of a flower. People might think these are hummingbirds. They're such good mimics. They're a day flying moth. They're a large moth and they beat their wings incredibly fast. Uh, they're called the hummingbird clear wing moth. And you can just maybe pick up here uh, in the photograph that there's actually um, the membrane of the wings is actually transparent. Um, and they also have, like their relatives, the butterflies, this long straw-like proboscis that can steal nectar without getting dirty, without getting the mess of pollen all over them. So generally speaking, but not entirely, the butterflies are really crap pollinators. They're just nectar thieves. They're in it. They're in it to win it for the butterflies themselves. But the pollinators, the real pollinators belong to a couple of different families. Not entirely, but they're well represented amongst those insects that are known as the hymenopterans, also known as the stinging insects, the wasps, the bees, the ants, and so on. Another family of insects that are quite good and effective pollinators are the flies. 
And the flies include uh, mosquitoes, very effective pollinators. Uh, you know what regular filth breeding flies look like. There are bee flies, uh, these crane flies, a lot of flies are actually nectivorous and a lot of flies are hairy enough to get covered in and thus transfer pollen from one plant to the other. So let's have a look at some of the pollination syndromes that plants employ to facilitate the transfer of their pollen from one flower to another flower. One syndrome is to have the flowers wide open so that there's a landing pad, there's a surface to pick up the pollen from, uh, the nectar is kind of produced way out there so that everything can happen just by simple transfer with the flowers open. Oftentimes with a dish or a bowl shaped flower, that's made all the easier. So you can see kind of a classic, if you were a little kid and asked to draw a flower, you might draw something that looks like this. You can see the anthers, they're kind of laying flat against the petals, the nectar being produced right at the base of all of those anthers. So our, our, our pollinator, our agent of pollination, who's really only there to get the nectar, is going to inadvertently get covered in pollen by brushing past the anthers. And also in so doing, transfer some pollen to the stigma right in the middle. That is facilitated by a flower that's presented like a dish or a bowl. Other flowers are, are more bell or funnel shaped, which requires a little bit of effort on the insect's part, on the vector of pollination, to actually crawl down into this tunnel area to get to the region where the nectar is being produced, thereby brushing up against the um, pollen bearing structures, the anthers, which might be located, of course, uh, towards the entryway into that tunnel, and thus getting covered in it again inadvertently for the insect, uh, but quite intentionally from the plant's perfect perspective uh, upon reaching the, the bottom of the flower there. What we have in this photograph of a wild petunia is actually a katydid nymph, the nymph of a um, herbaceous um, insect called a katydid. They are grasshopper relatives uh, when they are very young and not unlike many insect um, nymphs, uh, really, really hungry, not so good, mouth parts aren't quite firmed up yet, aren't quite fused up yet, so they might snack on pollen because it's very nutrient dense, it's very protein rich, building strong teeth and bones or exoskeletons as the case may be, so we have this young uh, insect feeding on pollen when it's young, eventually becoming more herbaceous later on in life. So here's a pollen thief. We talked about the insects being nectar thieves and not, not in bestowing any benefit onto the plant. Here we have this uh, katydid nymph not bestowing any benefit to this plant, it's just stealing its pollen. Luckily, plants make tons of pollen so that some can be wasted um, thus. Another syndrome is having these brush-shaped flowers so that there's no question if uh, any insect were to try and visit these little, see the little red petals down here? They're just tiny little reduced petals and the, the, uh, the nectar is produced in this uh, tube, this uh, red colored tube down here. But to get to any of this business, you got to pass by this brush of pollen. So very obvious that anything that comes close to this flower is going to get covered in pollen. This is seen also in the mimosa, where the actual, uh, the petals are 
wildly reduced at the base of these crazy filaments. So there's about, I don't know, a hundred flowers and all they are are these stamens sticking up, uh, ready to brush pollen onto anything that wants to come along and try and take some nectar from the, from the flowers that are nestled down inside that powder puff. Gullet shaped flowers, again, this requires the visitor uh, who is after the nectar reward to actually crawl back into the gullet or into the throat of this flower to receive the nectar and in so doing inadvertently brushing up against the anthers and receiving uh, the delivery of ripe pollen that it will then take to another flower. Uh, it might be interesting to note here if you haven't heard um, it is believed understood that insects can perceive through their special bug vision um, colors in the infrared and can um, pick up patterns, colors that might not be seen by humans, uh, but are apparent in the um, pre um, presentation of the flowers. Uh, with actual guides uh, that help the pollinator find the nectar and in so doing the pollen. So here you can actually see these little lines might be reminiscent of or might be associated with some tissues um, to help the pollinator find the nectar. The plant's gone through all this trouble because it wants the pollinator to find the pollen. Tube-shaped flowers, of course, are very good at um, hiding nectar way down in the bottom of the tubes, way down here, so that whatever the pollinator has to stick um, its face, proboscis, whatever it has, way down into the flower, therefore being covered in either loose pollen, or in the case of the orchids, like this one here, uh, one of the red lady tresses orchids. Uh, orchids actually place all their pollen in one parcel right onto the face of their pollinator. Uh, the orchids have um, something called a called pollinia, which are all of the produce all of the ripened pollen in one basket and it puts it right on the head of whatever has come to visit the flower. And when that animal retreats and goes off to the next orchid of the same species, it is dropped off. So they're just like the little insect UPS going, picking up a parcel from one place and dropping it off somewhere else. Facilitated in this case through these tubular flowers, not unique to orchids, but uh, tubular flowers work the same way physically having to prize open the flowers to get to the nectar is another syndrome, is another technique that plants have uh, adapted to ensure that they're not producing nectar for nothing. You got to work for it. And in so working, you're going to get covered in the, in the pollen. This is an iris inflorescence. Iris generally speaking, have these three flowers, one, two, and three. We're looking face on to one of the iris flowers on the tip of a stalk. Uh, and you can see again, those, those guidelines that are indicating that there might and probably is a nectar reward, but you have to go through these petals, which are folded down over the top of this landing petal lift them up, get in there, try and find the nectar inside, and in so doing, get covered in that pollen. So that's the iris. Another group of flowering plants, the legumes. We met some legumes earlier. Legumes also have, uh, the pea flowers also have that um, mechanism where the, the flowers have to have to physically be open. You have to open the door to these flowers. 
to get inside, to get the nectar reward. And in so doing, you're opening the door to being covered with pollen. So this is the little milk pea and the butterfly pea is the same way. Again, with the nectar guides, uh, the uh, insect or other organism is gonna use those guides to find the nectar that's produced under here in this boat shaped um, fusion of petals here. It's gotta work all the way through there and open up all these parts one of those secret doors is going to have the pollen in it and it's going to cover whatever's visiting with the pollen. So all this might seem kind of haphazard. We've got the flowers opening, presenting their anthers covered in pollen to the world, producing nectar that attracts the insects, the beetles, the flies, the mosquitoes, the moths, even the butterflies, the bees, everybody covering that organism up with pollen and then off it goes. Now what's gonna keep that creature covered in pollen from that species from just going to something else completely unrelated with that precious pollen and dropping it off at the wrong house? That's not going to do any good because a butterfly pea pollen landing on that lady's tresses orchid isn't going to help the orchid. That's just a waste of pollen, a waste of nectar, a waste of everything. So how have plants figured out how to make sure that their pollen is going to get to a member of their own species? Some flowers are configured only to fit the face of one species of insect so that that species of insect can only visit this, that, or the other flower. The orchids are really good at that. A lot of orchids, you might have even heard the ghost orchid down in the corkscrew swamp. There's only one species of sphinx moth that has the right apparatus uh, to coexist with that and, and facilitate the transfer of pollen. That's a little bit chancy. That's a little bit specific. Um, many insects evolving alongside with the flowering plants have developed this system called a search image, not a search engine. It's a search image that is an image that lives in the insect's brain, the individual insect's brain of a reward. And that image can become fixed from experience so that when that image exists in the brain of an individual insect, that individual insect knows to go to a red hibiscus flower for a particular reward. So that if it sees another red hibiscus flower, it knows because it remembers, it's got a search image, that if it goes to a red hibiscus flower, it knows exactly what kind of reward it's gonna get. And that is why it would take the pollen from one red hibiscus flower to another red hibiscus flower. It can be that precise. And like I mentioned before, search images can be fixed during the life of the insect so that it learns this and then just sticks to what it knows. But some insects are born with that search image already implanted so that once a insect develops into an adult and develops its wings and takes flight, it's already looking for a particular species of plant flower to collect a known reward from. I use the comparison. If you're driving around in a strange town where you've never been before, you have a search image in your head already. You already do. No, I'm not, this isn't a maybe, this is a definitely you have a search image in your head. 
And if you're driving around in a place where you've never been before and you're hungry, your search image is going to help you know exactly what rewards you're going to get for this much money and what it's going to taste like. You have a search image of the green circle with the mermaid lady in it. You know you're going to get a cup of burnt coffee for $3. And if that's what you want, you're going to see that red circle with the mermaid lady in it. You know that that's where you go to get the burnt coffee for $3. You see the yellow M, you know that for a dollar, you're going to get a hamburger and fries and a drink and what it's going to taste like. So anyway, that's the, the whole concept of search image is implanted in the brain. And it's how these plants can count on getting their pollen from one plant to another. So let's look at the relationship between some plants and pollinators. One of our native evergreen uh, shade loving shrubs, the wild coffee called Psychotria. Uh, it's um, related to real coffee, in fact, but it doesn't produce the coffee bean. Uh, it does produce a fruit with a seed inside, but um, humans have failed to um, produce uh, the fruit on a scale. Uh, the, the fruit production isn't really scalable. The reward for eating or drinking the uh, chemical constituents of the fruit of wild coffee hasn't really been um, recommended. Uh, it's called psychotria um, for a reason, um, but it is beloved of the honeybees. It provides the nectar. The honeybees are perfectly capable of transferring the pollen from one wild coffee to another wild coffee. Honeybees are not native. They are pollinators, yes, but they are not native. But this is an example of a native Florida plant that evolved in the absence of the European honeybee, but the European honeybee can facilitate its pollination. The wild coffee isn't, spe isn't so specific. It'll take any comers. So here comes the European honeybee. Wild coffee's got this one. It can use the European honeybee in addition to the native pollinators to get the job done. But the European honeybee has been domesticated by humans. And humans now can use a pollinator for the production of honey, of course, the European honeybee isn't making honey for us. It's not for our benefit, it's for the bees benefit. But being domesticated, humans can provide the bees with whatever they need, blah de blah de blah. And humans can also rely on the bees for pollination of non-native species. So European honeybees can be kept in these boxes and moved into orchards of non-native trees. When those non-native trees are flowering, doing their normal thing, presenting their pollen, producing their nectar, humans can introduce this imported species, the European honeybee, into the orchards, release the bees. The bees are gonna go about their thing, collecting nectar, and collecting that protein rich pollen. But some of the pollen is gonna get transferred from plant to plant. And does anyone know what this is? It's an orange blossom. So again, humans are gonna want these flowers to be pollinated so that the fruit will grow. We're not, we don't really care that much about the seeds of the orange. What we care about is the ripening fruit. That fruit's not going to ripen if the flowers aren't pollinated. So that's why we've got this nice little non-native tango going on in the orchard groves. And of course, a secondary benefit of keeping these bees 
not only because they can facilitate the, the pollination of the non-native oranges as a crop, but we can also harvest their honey as well. But we have plenty of native bees. We have plenty, we have a plethora, we have just about all the native pollinators that we need for our native plants. Everybody's very well adapted to one another. Let's look at some of our native bees to start with. Bees are um, almost pre-adapted to be excellent pollinators. As we mentioned, some bees collect the pollen intentionally because it is a very uh, protein-rich food that they can um, feed to their offspring or even eat themselves. Some bees actually have modifications to the hairs on their exoskeleton that collects the pollen on purpose. Um, the, this is one of the leaf cutter bees uh, and the pollen gets caught in this, this uh, pollen basket on the underside of the abdomen. When we see the leaf cutter bees flying around out here at Brooker Creek Preserve, we call them the diaper bees because they have these big bulging bottoms full of um, pollen, sagging with pollen. So they're, they got a, a full diaper as it were. But you'll notice that the, this bee is also covered otherwise in lots and lots of hair. That's gonna get some extra pollen stuck here and there. So when it visits another flower, that pollen is gonna obviously be transferred the leaf cutter bees are so named because they make these very symmetrical chops out of the edges of plants and they use that to line their nest burrows uh, where they then feed some of the pollen to their offspring that then uh, emerge as adults. The halictid bees are tiny, tiny, tiny little bees. Uh, they're like the sweat bees. Um, Again, modified to collect pollen. You can see on the hind legs, uh, there's a lot of pollen being collected in these hairs here, but also on the forearms, on the underside of the thorax, and even on the abdomen. Uh, although the, this, uh, this sweat bee is collecting pollen on purpose, it's also accidentally picking quite a lot up and transferring it from one flower to the other. Another is of uh, the sweat bees, of course, is this beautiful emerald bees. You can see this one is a little bit more tidy in its pollen capture. It's got them in much more discreet bundles at the base or the midsection of these uh, joints on the leg. And again, you can see in this case, that same metallic bee, its larva is living inside this tube where the bee has placed all these pollen, all this pollen bread that it has made from the little pollen bundles. So transferring the pollen, but also stealing some, but thankfully there's enough for everyone. The carpenter bees are very, very big. They look very much like bumblebees and they're certainly related to bumblebees. They're almost solitary like the bumblebees but they have these great big massive heads. Uh, they have these massive heads because they need the musculature to drive their jaws, to make their jaws strong enough to chew through wood, thus the name carpenter, where they make long tunnels lined with leaves and detritus and uh, pollen bread for their offspring but being bumbly, like the true bumblebees, they're also very hairy and covered in these hairs that can facilitate that pollen transfer, not only collection, but transfer from one species to another. I did mention earlier the flies are quite important pollinators. Uh, some flies are actually bee mimics. So they look like bees. This one's pretty convincing. It might be news to you that what you're looking at here is a fly and not a bee belonging to a completely different group of insects. Um, the flies uh, 
uh, that are the B mimics are also nectivorous, which means they're going to feed on the nectar of flowers. Being B mimics, they're going to be covered in hairs that helps with the disguise, but it also helps with, with pollen transfer. So what's good for the fly is also good for the plant, right? Because the, here comes an organism that's going to inadvertently pick up the pollen and fly off with it. Another one of the flower flies or the hover flies, these can be quite loud, um, very, very buzzy, and they will hang absolutely still in midair. Um, a bee, one of the bee flies, um, you can tell the difference between the bee flies or the bee mimics and true bees by their face you just kind of learn what a fly face looks like. Bees have much more linear eyes. Um, they're kind of, co they're cooler looking. I don't know, that's just weird. Anyway, the flies have eyes that almost touch one another. Uh, very, very dependent on sight for navigation. So you can see the two gymonstrous eyes here of this flower fly. So those are some of the groups of insects that are involved in pollination. Best for the plant. Let's look at some plant pollination syndromes, like how have plants kind of taken advantage of gullible insects or outsmarted some of these shysters like the butterflies. And we'll take a look first at this group called the milkweeds. And we all know that milkweed and monarch are associated to, well, you might know that milkweed, the plant, and monarch butterflies, the species, are kind of intertwined. Milkweed is a genus of flowering plants that, as the name implied, produces this milky latex that's very, very toxic. It's preventing itself from being chewed on by being toxic. The monarch larva that feeds on the leaves of these species, these milkweed species, they're immune to this. In fact, they incorporate it into their tissues, making themselves toxic. Mentioned before that butterflies aren't very good pollinators. Here's the milkweed's workaround. They've put their pollen into a little structure like the orchids, separate from the orchids, but just like the orchids did. They put them in a little um, bundle called a pollinia. And if you see this little tuning fork shape, I'm gonna circle it with the pointer here. This little tuning fork shaped thing with the, it's joined here and it's got the two bars there. That's the little pollinia. Let's look at it a little bit closer. This kind of inverted V shape is the pollinia. So the pollen is packed all into this little thing called the pollinia. So you can see with backlight, the little pollen grains inside this thing. And it makes this kind of clip shape that when these crappy pollinators land on a flower and start stomping around and trying to steal the nectar, the little pollinia grab onto those skinny legs and don't let go until they are transferred to another milkweed flower. So here's a honeybee, which would be perfectly capable of picking up loose pollen, but here it is stomping around on milkweed flowers and the legs are getting covered in these little pollinia. They're breaking free, ready to be transferred to the next flower. So that is the milkweed work around there. Another interesting syndrome is what's called buzz pollination. Buzz pollination is a, a, a occurs in plants who depend on a particular speed and frequency to release the pollen into the air. The pollen stays inside the anther until the anther is buzzed at just the right frequency 
and that lets the plant know that a suitable pollinator has arrived because it knows that insect's song. It knows that insect's buzz. And here we have a plant called Tibuchina, which you might be familiar with. And you can see this is a video. I'm gonna do my very best. Hopefully this will work. Let's cross our fingers. Ah. So you could see the bumblebee arriving and through its wing beats, it was vibrating at just the right frequency for uh, this plant, this tipicina, to release the pollen out of the pores in the front. In this part of the video, they're actually applying a vibration to the back side of the flower and it's having eliciting the same response. So that's buzz pollination. And there are actually quite a few important crops that depend on buzz pollination. So they depend on a particular species or a group of insects to facilitate that buzz. And if there's any threat to their pollinators, there's a threat to the production of these important crops like blueberries and like tomato berries, uh, these also release their pollen once the anthers are vibrated at a particular frequency. So I did mention that there are threats, human threats to pollinators. There are also, because it's all cat and mouse out there, what are some of the threats to the pollinators? Well, there's natural threats. Uh, there are spiders who have learned that if you just hang out on a flower long enough, something's going to come along to pollinate it. The green lynx spider is just such an ambush predator where it hides out, doesn't have to work very hard at all, and just reaches out when the pollinator lands on the flower and grabs its lunch. Other bugs, assassin bugs, they live up to their name by kind of creeping up on and stabbing um, pollinators when they land on a flower. And of course, pesticides. So this is of course the part where we um, request uh, using a very light hand when it comes to using pesticide because that caterpillar that's eating the leaves of your plant will someday might be just the right species of moth or butterfly, which actually will facilitate the pollination of a native plant. Um, you know, those, I hate to say, but mosquitoes, a lot of male mosquitoes are very important pollinators and they're, they're not blood suckers at all. They're actually nectivorous and they can facilitate the pollination. So just having a light hand and accepting a little bit, uh, when it comes to insect load in your garden. So just, um, from one probably arguably the cutest of the pollinating species, one of our native bumblebees. Just wanted to say thanks for joining us today. A uh, little bit about uh, pollination, pollination syndromes, hopefully opening the door a little bit wider on just what pollination means and what the different players and adaptations that are involved. I'd love to entertain some questions now, but first, as you're thinking up your questions, Julia's gonna launch a really quick poll. We always love to have your feedback. We're always looking for new ideas for new programs and just to get a feel for how everyone is doing that has tuned in today. So we'll just give it a few, uh, about a minute. I'm gonna mute and take a drink of water while y'all are doing that. Uh, really appreciate your feedback. <laughs> 
also advance to a couple of the next slides while y'all are answering those questions. Um, our presentations are recorded and they live on our YouTube channel. If you go to YouTube, just search for Pinellas Extension. Pinellas, like the county extension. Um, we are, of course, as I mentioned, part of UF IFAS Extension here in Pinellas County. And our catalog of online on-demand videos is growing. Uh, so check those out on the YouTube channel. If you didn't hear about today's presentation on Facebook, um, good for you. But if you really do want to keep up with what we're doing, we post daily to Facebook. And what you want to look for there is the Brooker Creek Preserve Environmental Education Center. We are the education center at Brooker Creek Preserve. If you have a complaint or a comment or something you didn't want to share with the group in the question and answer box, please do drop me a line at um, this email address. And here's a list of our upcoming classes for the rest of the month. So let's have a look at some of the Q and A's that we've got going on in here. And our first one, what's the advantage of the fly to look like a bee? That's an excellent question. And um, if you just chew on that for a second, you'll probably figure it out. Uh, bees, of course, belonging to that group of insects that have developed their egg laying structures into defensive venomous structures that can defend themselves um, and therefore be avoided by predators. So predators might avoid a stinging insect because it might have been stung once before. It might just have that uh, search image that says no. Um, and so the, that affords these flies that do not have the ability to sting uh, a little bit of protection. Very good. Uh, so we have plenty of pollinators. Right. I say we have plenty of pollinators. I thought there was a major problem with bee populations declining. Yes, we have a diversity of pollinators. That's true. We have a lot of representative species of pollinators um, from many different families on the scope of the, um, the huge insect class of animals. But yes, because of the classic factors of habitat loss, development, pollution, um, agricultural practices, there are negative impacts on populations of these native pollinators. So yes, we are, we're poisoning our environment and that's having a negative effect on our native pollinators as well, despite the fact that there are plenty of species, individual populations of these and across large areas are definitely being negatively impacted, which is always, you know, all, all the more reason to spread the word on tolerating a certain level of uh, insect load overall in your sphere of influence. Don't wipe out all the caterpillars that feeds the wasps. The wasps are the pollinators that are gonna help the goldenrod grow. So just tolerating and, and limiting the use of pesticide. Are there, see, this is a good one. Are there any native pollinators that are being replaced by non-native pollinators? That is incredibly tricky to study. Um, and there are so many there are more, I'll put it this way, there are more non-native plants arriving and providing potential food in the form of nectar to our native pollinators than there are non-native pollinators arriving that might displace our native pollinators. So that's a little bit of good news for our native insect population. It's ironic that the arrival of invasive, exotic, or just exotic plant species could be a benefit, um, but it is not that I know of any of our native pollinators getting 
squished out or not squished out, that's gross, but being um, kind of shoehorned out of existence uh, by the arrival of uh, non-native pollinator species. Um, when there are very, in the, in the case where there might be a species of plant which is dependent on just one species of pollinator, that's when things get really super dicey. Uh, and that is where keeping an eye on the health of the populations of that particular species of pollinator can be eat more easily monitored. It can be manifest in the success and decline of that plant that depends on that pollinator. Um, so those are the cases. Thankfully, there aren't that many that are so streamlined. Uh, uh, but, but again, orchids very often have such uh, narrow pollination uh, strategies that the loss of just one species of insect could cause that population to decline, if not disappear. Mm. Mm, 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 mm. So the question is about, there's a plant, uh, a shrub called Walter's Viburnum is currently flowering. What is, are the pollinators? I do not see the plant attracting bugs I can visualize. That's an excellent question. Walter's Viburnum produces hundreds, thousands of tiny little tubular flowers. They're kind of a flattened tube, but they all drop off like a little flower-shaped donut. Um, they're white. They're slightly fragrant. Um, I have seen bumblebees on Walter's Viburnum, but some flowers that are white and fragrant attract night flying insects. Being white, they can reflect the moonlight. Being fragrant, they can use chemical attractants uh, for creatures that use something other than eyesight to get around, usually some sort of chemical receptor in the form of antenna, which leads us to creatures like moths. So it's possible, given uh, the, the odor and the color of the flowers, that these might be moth pollinated. Are wasps pollinators? Yes, in fact, wasps are very good pollinators. Uh, they are related to the bees and they are hairy creatures. They're not as hairy as bees, but yes, wasps can facilitate pollination. And when you have a pollinator garden, again, you're going to have to tolerate the love bugs, the wasps, all the caterpillars that feed the wasps, that pollinate, um, and so on. Oh, what was the name of the plant, the buzz, the buzz pollinated plant? I will put that in the chat. T-I-B-O-U-C-H-I-C-H-I-N-A. It's a weird one. So I put in the chat the answer to the question, the name of that buzz pollinated flower. It's Tipichina. Must have plants for pollinators in Pinellas County. What are some must have plants for pollinators in Pinellas County? It's a tongue twister. Oh, must have. That's tough. Mm. Mm. That's hard. I would have to think about that. I can't, I can't pop that one off the top of my head. Uh, the question is, what are some must have plants for pollinators in Pinellas County? That'll have to be a follow up email. It's not flying off the top of my head. Um, you know what gets some really cool, I would have horse mint. If I had a garden, I would have horse mint. Horse mint gets the coolest stuff. Like if you want to study wasps, plant some horse mint. You get some really neat stuff there. Um, 
Can the same insect pollinate numerous flowers? Wait, come back. Can the same insect pollinate numerous flowers on the same plant, or does it need to land on another plant? Thanks. Perfect question. Left something out of today's presentation. I hope there's plenty of y'all sticking around still. How do plants keep from pollinating themselves? That's not a great idea, pollinating yourself. It's akin to um, inbreeding. In fact, it is the definition of inbreeding. The goal of sexual reproduction is outbreeding. And so how can an insect visit all over the place and not pollinate flowers on the same plant? The workaround that plants have devised there is very often time, T-I-M-E, a temporal separation between reproductive parts so that the nectar is available when one or the other of the parts are ripe. So if the pollen is ripe, the stigma is turned off so that the pollen from one flower cannot land on, or if it does land on, it's not gonna do anything, the stigma of the same flower or the same plant itself, so that a plant cannot pollinate itself. So yes, the, the same insect can go from flower to flower to flower on the same plant, but nine times out of 10, it is not going to trans, it, the pollen that it may inadvertently transfer is not going to grow and self-pollinate that plant. Gosh, I hope that makes sense. I rarely see European honeybees in the winter in Pasco County. Are they moved to other locations during the season? Pasco County North, a little bit colder. We do have wild populations of the European honeybee. They have escaped from cultivation. They have established, they have the ability to overwinter in hollows of trees. Uh, the colony numbers based on environmental factors are going to match the availability of food. So the queen's gonna live all winter long and only enough workers are gonna stick around that can survive the availability of food. Everybody else just gets to die. You're out, you're gone. That's why European honeybees produce honey to begin with, to survive an entire winter season with just enough workers to keep the queen alive and to keep the hive clean and to keep the young fed during the winter season so that it can all start again so what you're seeing probably in Pasco County is not a disappearance of all the honeybees, but just a severe reduction in force, in numbers. So there's only a couple of foragers out because they don't have the colony size to feed anymore. Can pollen heavy plants be used, used as a distraction for pollinators? I don't know. Really, can pollen heavy plants be used as a distraction? I'm not sure how to answer. I'm, I apologize that I cannot answer. Can, I, can pollen heavy plants be used as a distraction for pollinators? I don't know. If anyone wanted to weigh in, that'd be great. Um, Great, we're all good. We have a comment that um, today's presentation has, is encouragement to plant some native plants, and that's always a good thing. Always, always, always a good thing. We have a comment that partridge pea, which is a very um, common wildflower up here at Brooker Creek in the grassy areas and the upland areas, uh, is also buzz pollinated. So there's a native plant that's buzz pollinated. Yeah, that condition has popped up here and there and all over the place. It's not something that is unique to a particular group of plants. 
tomatoes are not related to blueberries, are not related at all to partridge peas, but they've all derived this condition of only releasing their pollen when they hit that perfect frequency. What do you do when a bee is chasing you? Well, just back up a little bit. Um, bees will defend a hive. So you're obviously, if there's bees after you, you're too close to the hive. But if a bee is just doing its job, visiting flowers, it could care less about you. So you're, you're actually quite safe observing bees, but stay away from their nest. They don't like that. They don't like it. They don't like their hive. Saw palmettos. We have a comment that saw palmettos are famous in my Pinellas County yard for paper wasp pollinators. At Brooker, they are covered in love bugs. We get the love bug pollinators, or at least the love bug nectar thieves um, up here in Pinellas County. So yeah, take a look. We're just at the beginning of spring now. Um, the flowers are gonna start reappearing uh, as soon as the wind pollinated stuff is done. Start checking out just who's visiting what flowers and you'll be amazed at the variety, uh, the diversity and the sheer numbers of insects that are taking advantage of that nectar production uh, and the plants that are taking advantage of uh, these kind of gullible uh, insect um, servants, as it were. So thanks for your questions. We're going to leave it there. We've gone a little bit over time. Julia's done a fantastic job uh, keeping you updated with some information in the chat. Thanks for joining us. Here are the dates for the upcoming classes for the rest of the month. All of these, 2 o'clock on Wednesdays. Uh, sign up just like you did today. We'll next week be looking at Kitchen Botany, followed by Spice Science. Botanical Science for Beginners, and then the good stuff, an introduction to plant identification. Leading on to next month in April, we'll be teaching advanced plant identification. Uh, we'll send the link out. Uh, uh, actually, we will put the link on our Facebook page um, once registration is open. So looking forward to seeing you in the rest of the month, and thanks for joining us today. I'll let you get back to this cold gray day and enjoy it. Thank you.